Hello and welcome to our second to last video here in my our Through My Bible in One Year series here at St. John's. I'm sure uh, as much as I'm going to miss filming these with you, Nick's going to miss even more filming them with me. But we're very grateful to Nick for all of the technical expertise that he's given us throughout the year. And I wanted to mention that, at least in the second to last video, that, that this wouldn't have been able to be produced and then posted without everything that he does. As you've started to wrap up the book of Job and Revelation, though we still have an awful lot to go through in both Job and Revelation, I asked you as you actually started Job to put yourself in Job's place with all of the destruction that he endured. After the first two chapters of his book, what makes you most sad if you are Job? And you could come up with several things, I suppose, but uh, I've narrowed it down to three considerations on my part. First of all, possessions can be replaced. So uh, as hurtful as it is to lose all of his riches, uh, to, to lose all of his livestock, the loss of Job's children would be an especially deep hurt to, to have them die all at one time in the same place. And then, uh, as you move on through chapter 2, and Satan inflicts physical pain on Job, Job, though there may be ways to distract yourself from loss. When you lose someone dear to you, you can't ignore ongoing physical pain. It's just always there, and I know some of you have dealt with that too. When your body is screaming out to you that there's something wrong, you can't ignore it, and Job could not ignore that physical pain. You have that, 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 that very sad comment that he, he, he would take a broken piece of pottery and try to scratch himself to give him just a few, give himself a few minutes of relief uh, for, from that ongoing pain. But there is something else yet too. Uh, when all these things happened, instead of bolstering his faith, his spouse and, and his three friends challenged his faith. Uh, to, to hear your own spouse speak against God has to be an injury to your soul. When you just think, oh, instead of helping me bear this burden and point me to God, she's actually tearing me away from God. That must have been a terrible burden for Job to carry. And I don't know how best to put it except this way, with friends like Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, who needs enemies? Uh, as they <laughs> conspire through most of the book of Job to try to get Job to admit what a terrible person he is, how, how, he, how deserving he is of this seeming punishment from God. And Job uh, can just come back at them again and again and say, no, I am no different than you. I didn't do any of this. I don't understand this. Now, as you move through then the second vi set of visions in the book of Revelation, the seven trumpets, I asked you to consider how they mirror the seven scrolls and what new information do the seven trumpets convey. And of course, we could go in depth and look at each of the seven seals and the seven trumpets and how they are, uh, how the particular things that are talked about uh, have been seemingly fulfilled in human history. But taking it as a whole, like a replay, we, we see this world getting progressively worse until the end of time and Christ's final judgment. So in that sense, the trumpets and the seals are pretty much the same. Things get worse and worse. Uh, yeah, life here on earth gets more difficult for God's people. There is destruction, there's disease, there's violence, and then Christ comes and ends it all. But in this vision of the seven trumpets, we are also given some more details. We're given the details of the two faithful witnesses, the, the, the ongoing gospel proclamation, uh, actually law and gospel proclamation of Christ's church. And these two witnesses are not endured by the world. The, the, the world persecutes them, puts them to death. Uh, we are told going back in time about the war in heaven. Not in a great detail, uh, and I've often wondered if when we get to heaven, as much as we have memorials and museums that are dedicated to the events of wars that we fought here in this world, if there will be a memorial of some sort or a museum that will explain the war in heaven more, because it just leaves you desiring and aching for more detail. War in heaven. 
and and then you have that wonderful description so uh, so pertinent at Christmas time about the woman and the child, the reference to the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, his coming into the world, and even as a frail infant, he still holds all power in his little hands, and he cannot be defeated by Satan. So, as you move on now and take a large chunk of Job and Revelation for next time, you're going to get to Job chapter 19, the most well-known part of the book of Job, and that great statement that he makes. As you read it, please note the context of Job's great, I know that my Redeemer lives statement. And we'll talk about that next time. Also, you'll want to identify the two beasts of Revelation 13 as you move on through the description of Babylon and the, the suffering that Babylon brings upon the world. Uh, we'll also talk about the identification of Babylon in context of the two beasts as well, but identifying those two beasts and how they interact in the world is going to shed an awful lot of light on the rest of the book of Revelation. God's blessings on your readings this week, and we'll look forward to seeing you next week.